So it's noon in Utah, so we are going to get started. This is our second webinar for the Grand Challenge, and I'm really excited about it. So just a few reminders. Um, if you have a question, please feel free to type it in the Q&A uh, section, and questions will be answered at the end. There's about 20 minutes for Q&A, so we'll get through as many as possible, and we'll just go in the order that they come. So the first question asked will be, um, or the first question typed will be asked first and so on. Um, Tanja Miles from Set Free, Set Freed Indeed Ministry is here today to talk about suicide prevention and 988. And we are so excited to have you present. So thank you. Um, and this webinar is being recorded. So without further ado, Tanja, whenever you're ready. Well, happy Thursday, everybody. And look, thank you so much, Rachel, for all that you do. Um, I appreciate you more than you know. Um, I love Utah. I'll talk about that later. We were having a, a little conversation about that, but I just want to say thank you for hosting this webinar. Much needed conversation will around, you know, mental health and 988 and uh, suicide prevention. Uh, just a shout out, first of all, to uh, all that you guys do at the Huntsman Institute, you guys are amazing. Uh, everything that you're doing with the Grand Challenge is on point and so many other amazing things that you're doing at the, I guess I could say the university. Mm -hmm. So let me go ahead and put it out there. So we know that I'm from Baton Rouge on the outskirts where I live in the outskirts of, of Baton Rouge. And we know that, you know, LSU, uh, ladies just won the championship, but before we got to the ship, we had to play you guys. It was a good game. So go Utah. Yay. So anyway, so yes, yeah, so I just had to put that out there because I'm sure some of y'all saying, what well, didn't she play? Yeah, we did. So uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, at the end of the day, we're all connected. We all need each other. We live in this great space called America, the universe, the world, and we all have to be good stewards of uh, uh, each other and just this amazing space that we get to take up. And so, yeah, I'm just grateful for the work that you guys do. Shout out to the Huntsman family, you know, Christine and, and David for all that they're doing and leading the charge. And of course, to Dr. Mark and Seth and again, you, Rachel, and to all the staff who do amazing work. Um, also a shout out to David Covington, who is my uh, partner in peace, who couldn't be with us today. And um, so I'm just going to dive in and just share my heart, my soul, the raw, the real, the goofy, the good. Uh, I'm a lot of things, uh, but I think the best thing about me is that I'm funny. I think I am. I think I'm really funny. I think I crack myself up. So if I start laughing at myself and they all don't laugh, shame on y'all. But uh, yeah, uh, my, my, my world is, you know, uh, talking about mental health and suicide prevention and addiction. Uh, it wasn't something that I woke up one day and said, you know what? I think I want to work in this field. It was something that kind of chose me. Uh, when I was seven years old, I was molested. And that happened for many years. The first time that uh, I tried to kill myself, I was 13. Uh, I was sexually active at the age of 10. Started using drugs at an early age. Uh, I sung in a band because I always wanted to sing. I was this little girl with the big teeth that you see now. And the big forehead that you probably can't see because of the weave, which looks good. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, I just had the hopes and dreams to uh, sing on Broadway and to entertain people because I love to make people laugh. I love to make people feel good. And uh, I was this little girl who used to sing and just love to engage people. And I went from being this happy, go lucky little girl with a big smile and just loved everybody to this monster. And, um, I always said that I died and nobody grieved for me. Um, my parents did not know what to do with their little girl the first time she tried to kill herself. You know, they didn't know what to do with their little girl who got kicked out of elementary school because I had so many behavior challenges that I stayed mad all the time. Just mad at the world. My parents used to ask me, why are you always so mad? I don't know. You know, and I couldn't articulate that. And so... I grew up fighting a lot. Like I said, getting kicked out of elementary school. I met a um, teacher uh, many, many years ago when I was at, um, at a particular church. And he came up to me afterwards. He said, I, I don't think you remember me, but I remember you. I remember you when you were a little girl. And um, I'm just amazed because I didn't think you would amount to nothing. 
And y'all, I remember those words because I'm like, wow, I'm a grown woman. And I was that young. And for someone to say that that's how they saw me. And to be honest, that's how I was. I had all these emotions that I did not know what to do with. And um, so I internalized a lot of stuff. And I grew up being a bedwetter, a cutter. Um, I had eating disorder challenges where I got addicted to laxatives. Most of the time, I hated the skin that I was in. Um, the first time I got raped was very traumatic and it happened again and again. And so there was just so many things that happened because of trauma. My parents, again, like I said, did not know what to do with me because there were not resources available for a little you know, black girl that looked like me. And then also too, because of tradition, it's just something that you did not talk about in the black community. The first time I tried to kill myself, I remember my you know, aunt coming in the hospital. I was getting my, my stomach pumped because back in the day, that's what they did. They stepped a tube down your nose, through your throat and your stomach. And, you know, and, and I could not talk, but she was just saying, Tanja, you know, when you, when you get out, you know, you just need to trust God. You need to go to church more, which I did, but I got worse. And nobody else talked about it after that. And so I just grew up with all these emotions, all this erratic behavior. Uh, and I just did not like the skin I was in. It was like most of the, most of my life, y'all, I was living to die. Uh, I wasn't scared of death, still not. Um, and so I just hated myself. And so when drugs was introduced to me, it was just easy for me to do that. When prostitution was introduced to me, it was easy to do that. Look, you know, I say this to make myself feel better. Uh, no, I wasn't standing out on a corner. You know, um, I, you had to have money and you had to be married. But at the end of the day, you can call it a, a, a whatever you want. A rose is a rose is a rose. And I thought that me doing that was making myself better because I had been giving sex away for so long. And someone told me about an uncle that they had that had money. He was married. He just wanted to kick it with somebody. And I'm like, you know, I've been giving it away. Might as well start getting paid for it. And so uh, that began my years of, you know, prostituting. And look, every time I did it, I thought almost like I was getting power from men because men hurt me so much. But what I was really doing is giving my power away. And then I needed more drugs. And so I tried to kill myself again. The second time I tried to kill myself, I ended up in a mental hospital. Um, one of the worst things that ever happened. Uh, someone asked me last week. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, they said, Tanja, they were talking about, you know, restraining someone who's having a mental health crisis and, you know, my thoughts on that. And they said, you know what, I've asked you a lot of stuff, and I never asked you, have you ever been, you know, felt trapped like that? And I felt trapped like that in other spaces, but I know how it is to be in a hospital. And look, when I went to the mental hospital, they said it was for my own good. I wasn't even violent at the time. And, um, but there's like, you know, we have to, you know, we have to, you know, restrain you just for your own good, you know, and I'm, like, wow, you know, and that was the worst two hours I have ever been through. And so to know that we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go is really legit. And so, like I said, just grew up having a lot of issues, did a lot of drugs. Like I said, started off doing, uh, doing marijuana. And before you know it, I was doing pills. Pills led to um, uh, other drugs uh, such as cocaine. And that was my jam. You know, that was something that, you know, looked like gave me superpower. And, but before you know it, uh, at the end of it, I was a straight up crackhead. Um, I did not like who I had became. Um, I just wanted to die. And so when I finally got sick and tired of being sick and tired, I never forget, um, I was my grandmother who I called and my grandmother told me that I had a purpose here on this earth. And I took her at a word, even after all the things that I had been through. Um, and so that's when I did not look back and it's been, I guess around 37 years, I know I don't look like it, 37 years that I've been, you know, free from drugs. And, you know, I'm excited about that because most people think that I would not live to be 18. And the fact that I have this many birthdays and the fact that I am still alive, uh, I am very intentional about my time because I felt like time was always against me. My mama used to tell me, you know, Tanja, you living off ball times because I was just so reckless and careless. Uh, because I hated myself. I was my enemy. The enemy was not on the outside. The enemy was in me. And what I was doing was I was punishing myself from the molestation because I thought it was my fault. Why did I keep going back? Why didn't I tell anybody? You know, why I put myself in places to be gang raped and to be, 
beaten and to have guns to my head and to have so much trauma. Somebody even asked me, what's the most traumatic thing you've ever been through? And, you know, trying to fight back the tears, I could not answer them because there was not one thing, there was several. And so I know how it is to be jacked up, messed up in your head that you think you're worthless, that you're hopeless, that you'll never amount to nothing because you're told that, because I was acting like that. And finally, you know, when I did, you know, get my life in order, I, I knew I had to do something. I knew I had, there were so many more people who felt like me because the places and spaces that I went to get help told me they didn't know how to help me. And, you know, being a, a person who um, uh, was, was born into a family of faith and always told, you know, you got to go to church and trust God, that's all good and dandy. But at the end of the day, faith without works is dead. And I don't care what faith that, you know, you are affiliated with, you know, when you put faith and science and medicine and data and all that stuff together, it looks like me. It looks like hope. It looks like we can work together and we can address mental health, suicide and, you know, and, and crisis. And so the uh, last time I tried to kill myself uh, was seven and a half years ago. And let me just say this. I have done, you know, been able to do a lot of amazing things, uh, start a nonprofit, certified peer support specialist. I'm a veteran. I'm an ordained pastor. I'm a wife of 29 years, 29 years, y'all. That's a miracle for me. You know, uh, I have this amazing husband. I have an amazing family and friends and uh, I have a pretty good life. And uh, when I started doing some work with the White House um, in 2023, I went to the State of the Union dress. That's the story for another day. But after that, a lot of the trauma that I never got treated, even though I had a open up the first licensed faith-based treatment center in the state of Louisiana, first was counting the nation, I still did not understand trauma. and all of that stuff. And so when I was going through all of this time, the trauma came back like nobody's business. And um, I began to experience anxiety and depression like never before. And the thoughts of suicide came back, you know, like a wrecking ball, even though suicide was always in my back pocket. It was always my plan B. Um, always, always, always. Um, I don't mind pain. I can take a lot of pain um, because I've been through a lot of pain but it's the suffering that I have a challenge with. And, uh, and I know people going, wait, is that, that's different. That's the same. No, it is different. Long story short is, is that um, my husband and I were going through some bad times and being a person that's in the community doing all this amazing stuff and people knowing Darren and Tanja, you know, you guys have this great life. You're doing all this amazing work and you're helping people, you're saving lives, but the life that was really, you know, needed to be saved the most was mine. And I was told that, you know, when my husband and I got married, my husband's never been on drugs, um, never had anything traumatic happen to him except me, for real. And uh, just came from this really cool, great life. And he's always wanted to help people. And because of my background, I was told, Tanja, if you guys have a, if you guys ever get a divorce, you know, you're going to be blamed. And I'm like, yeah, Probably so, you know, I'm gonna get blamed for my past because, oh, you know, that's Tanja, you know, and poor Darren. And uh, when we separated, nobody knew we were still doing a lot of community work. We would show up at church together. We'd be out in the community together and people just thought we were together. And only maybe five people knew that we weren't. And I was staying at a friend of mine's house. Anyway, we were reconciling, going to counseling. First time ever going to therapy. I know, right? And um, I realized doing therapy that, you know, yeah, me and Darren had problems, but then I also had some challenges. And so um, we were getting counseling and the goal was for me to move back home. And we were scheduled to move back home. I was scheduled to move back home and we got in, into a little tizzy. And so I just said, this is it. I'm not gonna get out this marriage without my good name. I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. Um, I'm out, you know, I can't do this anymore. I'm tired. And I uh, took all the medicines that, you know, I was given by my doctors to help me stay well. And they were some pretty heavy duty stuff. Uh, and so I went to find a place to kill myself. And I wrote a suicide note. Anyway, um, of course, um, the note was found in time. My nephew, who was just happening in town, wanted to surprise me and come out of house. And when he came to the door, the door was open. He called my name. I didn't answer. And so then he saw pills 
on the floor, then he saw the suicide note. And so he started calling my family and everything. And so anyway, um, I did get to PC, I got picked up by the police, went to uh, the hospital, mental hospital, and guys, let me tell you, um, for the first time in my life, I saw the pain on my family and friends' face. About 15 or 17 of them came in and all of them had the same look of fear. They had the same look of hurt, the hurt that I had been feeling all of my life. I saw on their faces and I realized then that the pain that I was going through and the shame and all the stuff that I was going through would not have died with me. It would have transferred to my family and my friends and there's no way I was gonna allow that kind of pain to ripple through their lives. And the pain didn't, wouldn't have died with me. It would have transferred from them and to generations. And that was an aha moment for me. Also getting counseling was an aha moment for me. Going through EMDR training, I'm sorry, uh, therapy was an aha moment for me. Finally accepting you're gonna be on medication the rest of your life. Finally was an aha moment for me. So all of those things came together. And can I say, for the first time in my life, in the last seven and a half years, I have not had a suicide ideation ever. That's major because it was always in my back pocket. And I knew one day I would tell this story uh, I knew one day people would be shocked by it. Uh, but when David Covington said, Tanja, I want to tell you a story about the suicide attempts, you know, previously. And I said, David, I have one for you. And um, it's time to tell it. And I told my husband, I said, you know, we got to tell the story. And so I told the story and it became a, a part of his series, Moving Souls on Suicide. And anyway, so I share my, my shine but I'm also gonna share the manure because people need to know that there's hope. People need to know that you're not the only one because when those thoughts start racing in your head, you're thinking you're the only one, no one will never understand, but there are people that do. And that's why I'm so grateful about the grand challenge and you know, getting everybody involved and peers involved and all of these other folks because we can, we can reduce stigma. I believe we can, we can really address uh, suicide prevention because look, I believe I'm alive for many reasons, but I believe that I'm really alive from this last time to let people who are contemplating know, baby, that pain does not die with you. And I knew, and I know if people knew that before picking up that, whatever they choose, you know, to do death by suicide by, or taking whatever, that they would realize, you know, you are not the only one and the pain don't die with you. So live to tell your story like I get to do every day and wake up and push hope every day for real, for real. And so even when I heard about 988, I was like, wait, is this really happening? Because at the end of the day, I've been in this business for so long. And the fact that you know we have something like 988 I never thought would happen in my lifetime. And I am so grateful for all the folks who put that into place. Look, I do a lot of work in, in our community, in our country. And so um, I, I, I remember old school treatment. I remember old school policies, which we still have to change because some of them are old school and we need to address that. But you know, sharing my story of hope, sharing all of the things that I've been through is necessary because I want people to know that together we can uh, we can we can we can do something we can change the way we treat people and and we do treatment and prevention and things of that nature and so when I first heard about 988 I'm like oh, okay this is pretty cool because I had heard about it some years ago and then I kind of watched it and then got involved with it you know through David Covington and testified on Capitol Hill twice in favor of 988 they used my my story and I'm grateful for that, you know, because all of that evil and all of that bad had to be used for good. And so why not use my voice? And, um, you know, and, and I remember, you know, being, you know, a peer and, and, and being around these all these amazing people who are doing all this work. And so I'm just like, wow, 988 is going to be great. And it's a game changer for real, for real, because I've seen it on both sides. 
look, I've been involved in crisis. What I didn't tell you is that when I was, uh, last time that I was uh, picked up and look, my mom, I had to get my mom PEC. My mom was an alcoholic. She had 25 years clean before she died. And I had to get my mom PEC. And to see a police officer put your mom in the back of a, um, of a police car in handcuffs because she was sick. She wasn't a criminal. But at the time, that's all the, the, the policy knew to do. You come and get her, you pick her up, and you handcuff her, and you put her in the back of a police car. Or the time my Uncle Larry, uh, who I had to get PEC, probably about right before COVID, 11 times in one year. And look, I know the system. I work in the system. I know people. But because I'm an advocate, I didn't want to have to call any make any favors because I wanted to go through the process just like everybody else. I mean, I'm not going to be the advocate, you know, for everybody, you know, telling everybody else what they got to do, but when they do it, you know, I'm going to call every person that I know and it's, it's okay to have favor, but I just wanted to make sure I knew what that process looked like so I can tell other people how to navigate through it. And so to have 988 in place where law enforcement don't have to be called that they can be trained and licensed professionals who will come and help you on your worst day to get you to better days. I'll say that again, help you on your worst day to get you to better days, you know, is a game changer. And to have that number where people can call and the person's on the other side, side is a licensed and trained, you know, compassionate, um, confident, you know, voice that can help you get you to the help that you need because look at the end of the day if we just got a phone number without resources what have we done you know like i tell people all the time i'm I, I, i'm grateful i have a good story to tell but you know me without a story me with a story with no resources so we have to let people know there's hope but then we also have to have resources and so the fact that there's a continuum that's a part of that whole 988 uh uh beautiful you know crisis number it's a game changer for our community. And, you know, it's still my desire, even though we're not, you know, in it a year yet, you know, it's coming up on July 16th, but, you know, we still have a lot of work to do, particularly in communities of color because of traditions, trauma, and trust. We don't call lines. I mean, that was never, that was never a, a, a option we had. That is not even a resource we knew about. Well, we're gonna make sure people know about it this time because people need to know that there's hope, help and healing and they are not the only one. Cause I'm telling you, when you get in that space in your head where the anxiety and the depression and you think you're a failure and you'll never make it and you'll never amount to nothing and all the bad stuff that you've done, you have done is hitting you in the head and you don't know what to do with it. And you're just thinking, I just need out. I cannot do this anymore. And then to just realize that there's help that there's someone that can walk you through it, someone who can understand, who's not gonna judge you. See, that's what the grand challenge is all about. You know, talking about stigma, because at the end of the day, you know, all of us have, have stuff that we're dealing with in our lives. And look, if you look at TV, I mean, talking about trauma, I mean, let's be real. If you don't know about P-Valley, look at it. It's a little risky, but it's all about trauma. You might not like how people lifestyles turn out, that's not what that's about. It's about their backstory and the trauma, you know, or what about all the, I was watching that, what, uh, Young the Restless, 50 years old. I remember that, my, you know, with my grandmother watching the Young the Restless. And, oh, that was about trauma. I'm like, come on, y'all live in the general city and all of y'all got money and, and power and all this and, and got trauma out the wazoo. Oh, let's look at Yellowstone. Are you kidding me? Bethany, trauma. Rip, trauma. You know, Jamie, trauma. So we have to address trauma. Or if we're looking at the music that our kids are listening to now, for example, Rod Wade, who is amazing, but all of his stuff is about PTSD and what our kids are going through. And I ask kids, I do a lot of work inside schools uh, and, and a lot of assemblies and a lot of healing circles, you know, in, in elementary schools and high schools and in, and in middle schools and in college campuses. And I ask them, I say, what are the things that you listen to the most? that gets you in that good place. Cause we have to teach our kids that it's okay to feel cause baby, you can heal and for real. And, but how do we get our kids, you know, to, to talk about their feelings. And so I asked them, what are you listening to? Tell me what you're listening to. And a lot of them say, I'm Ms. Tanja Anderson, right away. I'm like, I don't know who that is. And they're just like, oh, he, I'm like, why are you listening to him? He's like, cause he gets me. He knows what I'm talking about and he can understand. And I start listening to right away. And I'm like, oh Lord, our kids in trouble. And so, 
you know, we have to talk about suicide. We have to talk about suicide prevention. We have to talk about crisis. We have to talk about feelings and trauma because people are going through it. Not only just our kids, but you know, if COVID ain't taught us nothing, it taught us, baby, ain't nothing like crisis to make us all equal because we were all going through it. And so we know that people need help. And so, you know, to have 988 in, in, in this space in our lifetime is a game changer. We just need to make sure that more people know about 988. We need to make sure that the people that we put in offices on Capitol Hill will continue to fund, you know, uh, uh, 988 and crisis continuum and things like that uh, uh, around mental health and substance abuse. We have to make sure that on the local level, wherever you live, that we're keeping people accountable because everybody's talking about mental health. But I'm like, baby, let me just say, this ain't no hashtag or a, a tagline. You know, this is my life. This is a lot of people I know. This is our life. You know, it's not something that's just sexy because ain't nothing really sexy about it. Matter of fact, when before I got diagnosed, they thought I had MS at first and went to spend a lot of money. It wasn't MS. And then came back home and then they thought it was a brain tumor. Did the kick scans and everything and it was no brain tumor. But that was trauma on my brain, but it was a trauma you couldn't see. And to be honest, guys, I wish sometime I had a brain tumor than having PTSD and anxiety and depression because people deal with you different. They treat you different. And that's just real talk. And so we have to address stigma like never before because that shouldn't be, I wish I had a brain tumor you know, instead of having, um, uh, um, you know, a diagnosis of PTSD and anxiety and depression. We have to change that. You know, so 988, a game changer in our lifetime. We have to continue to make sure people know about that resource. And again, we need to make sure that the people that we put in office are going to make sure that there's money to address and to make sure that there's good treatment and that policies and procedures are always good for, you know, for folks like me and anybody who's having kind of uh, any, any, any mental health or substance abuse crisis. Suicide prevention, I'll never forget. I heard David talk about zero suicide and y'all, I was like, bro, that ain't gonna never happen. Now that was way back in the day. Cause I thought, you know, I thought about myself and thinking, you know, that's gonna always be my plan B. And the fact that it is almost eight years and I've not had a suicide ideation or a thought or an attempt that's a game changer. And so it's my desire that we push hope like never before, that we let people know that you are not the only one, that there's hope, help, and healing, that there is no judgment, no stigma, no judgment, no stigma. And so to get people you know, to a place where their worst day can be, become you know, the beginning of some of their best days. I believe in that. I'm living proof that if we work together, that if we not just talk about it, but be about it and make sure that people know that addiction and mental health and suicide ideations does not discriminate from the curbside to the country club, it can happen to anyone. It doesn't care if you're black, white, rich or poor. We know that we have to do a better job to address you know, communities of color who don't have the resources. Look, there's still a lot of people don't know about 988 and calling 911. And to be honest, some people don't want us to call 911 because, you know, we know how mass incarceration started. And unfortunately, it started with people who had issues with, with addiction. And it was just an easy way to fill up our jails, not on our watch. And so we have to, we addressed it. And then mental health came into place. And then, you know, I've been doing volunteer work inside of prisons probably about, about 20 years. And I never forget seeing the paradigm shift of people, you know, who had mental health diagnosis, who weren't criminals, they were just in crisis. I've been there. I've been there when I was in crisis. One police officer treated me like I was in crisis. The other treated me like I was a criminal. I know how that feels. I also know how to be on side, inside of a jail and a prison and to see people struggling to stay sane or to see or to be in a prison and you can hear people screaming from the top of their voice, because the only place that they have is not a place where they can go and get quiet, but is on lockdown. And it's not to lock them up, but it's to keep them safe from themselves because if there's no space, we have to change that. And I believe together we can. And so as I end my you know, time 
of just sharing with you guys. I just want to say thank you so much for being a part of a part of this webinar. Because at the end of the day, this is how we change policy. This is how we address stigma. This is how we address how people treat those like me who have mental health diagnosis or people who are struggling with addiction. You know, the cool thing about 988 is that you can call it if you're having a mental health crisis. If you think that you want, you know, to end your life or if you have an issue with addiction, we know that fentanyl ain't no joke. Ain't nobody safe. Everything is being laced with fentanyl. And so the fact that someone can call and pick up the phone and say, look, I don't want to die. I was just trying to get high. Can you please help me? Can you please get me into the resources that I need so I can live? That's a game changer. And, the, and we need to let people know that there's options and there's help and there's hope. Because at the end of the day, that's what we all would want for ourselves and for our loved ones. And I believe that Fentanyl is no joke in our community, our country. And, you know, we're doing some amazing things where I live in Baton Rouge, but, you know, we all are affected by this. And so to have these resources is amazing. So 988 is great. 988 is a game changer. And I pray and I hope and I encourage you and, and, and I rally you to go. If you don't know, find out more about 988. Find more about what the crisis continues look like in your area, in your state, and make sure you hold those in accountable to make sure they sustain it. And so, because like I said, if we just got a number without no resources, what are we really doing? And then of course, when it comes to, you know, suicide prevention, you know, I never forget, you know, one of my mentors, who's one of the biggest uh, um, suicidologists in the country, and we were talking and he said, Tanja, at the end of the day, you know, the simplest thing we can do is ask people, where does it hurt and how can I help? Where does it hurt and I, how can I help? And then I'll end, I'll do, end with a third one. You are not the only one. And so I'm just grateful that you guys could have been doing so many amazing things. And the fact that you're on this webinar because you want to know, because when we know better, we do better. When we know, you know, we grow. And so now to just take these seeds of wisdom and now push it out in our communities. But look, my mom always told me that charity begins at home and spreads abroad, meaning that we have to take all this knowledge and start with us first or start with our house because I believe that healing starts in the house. If we have healthy individuals, we have healthy homes. When we have healthy homes, we have healthy communities. We have healthy communities, we have a healthy country. And at the end of the day, all of us want, we want peace, we want love, we want to be protected, and we want to be respected. And one thing that I realized as being a person who's been most of their lives suicidal and also homicidal, when I finally made peace with myself, it was easier for me to make peace with others. So I just want to say thank you so much. If you work in this field, thank you. If you're one of the brave people who have a mental health diagnosis and you wake up every day and 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 and, and, and you make sure that you take care of yourself, thank you. If you are a caregiver to someone who uh, has a mental health diagnosis or addiction, thank you for what you do. If you are just a professional or it doesn't matter, anybody who work in this space, thank you, thank you, thank you. And together we are making a difference and we're going to make even a greater difference together, for real, for real. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Tanja. Your story is, is so powerful. And I love really that message of hope that you are spreading. So thank you. We have a few comments very similar thanking you. So Laura said, thank you for your story. Resilience is key and self-love. We can ask everyone in the world to change their opinions about stigma, but it won't make a bit of a difference until we end stigma about ourselves. And then Marie Dyack also said, thank you, very powerful. So um, I think everyone on the call really related to and appreciated your story. If you want to take a minute and um, just chat about Set Free and Deed Ministry and maybe give a summary, and then we can we can dive into more questions as well. Sure. So yeah, my husband and I, we started Set Free and Deed Ministry in 2000 something. No, it was still, we started in 1999, I think. Okay, Prince, 1999. All right. All right. I love songs, y'all. I'm just saying I would sing, but not today. 
Um, but yeah, we started Set Free D because one of the things that happened is, is that, you know, I talked to you guys about, you know, my um, faith-based background. And so when I did get off drugs, now I, I went cold turkey. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that, you know, for people. That's why treatment is cool. Therapy ain't scary. But I went, you know, cold turkey from, from crack cocaine. And, uh, but I knew that I needed to dive in and do some more work because I was a hot mess. I ain't gonna lie. I was a hot mess. And um, I went to the church and the church basically told me, we don't know what to do with you. And I'm like, okay, this is rich. And so I began to just do research and I didn't see anything out there, particularly in my community. So I began to, uh, you know, write and just, you know, do the research. And I'm like, well, what if we can get, you know, the faith-based component with the treatment piece and the two shall become one. And I begin to write curriculums and stuff like that. And then fast forward, um, we started doing set free in my grandmother's house. And then we started, it got big. And then we started doing it in a friend of mine house who was at LPC. And then we started doing it, you know, we were already doing work at the Salvation Army, which we did for 20 something years and in other spaces in prison. And so it just grew to a Friday night. We knew we wanted to do something on Friday night because that's the peak time that people have, they struggle the most. Anyway, we did that. We would start going out into communities. We would find out what was the worst communities in East Baton Rouge Parish. And we would go there for six months and we would go into the parks. We would do blocks, block, block parties. And we just began to do all this amazing work. And then it just grew and grew and grew. And I never forget when I had a conversation with the state finally. And I told them, I said, look, one day I'm going to have a first licensed faith-based treatment center in the state of Louisiana. And they told me this for real, hell no, that will never happen because of separation of church and state. I'm like, okay, you told me no game on. And so again, I began to write a curriculum and uh, fast forward to 2003 when I got a call from the white house. And one of the things is you had to have a faith-based component. If you wanted to get the funding that president Bush was talking about, well, guess what? There was not a curriculum. Guess who wrote a curriculum? Yes. And so anyway, the rest is history. So that's how we started. We still do work today. We do a lot of work. We have eight wonderful peers. Some of them are probably on this call. Shout out to you guys uh, who hold it down every day, who are out in the street 40 hours a week, pushing out resources about our stabilization center, about 988, about you know fentanyl awareness and Narcan and fentanyl testing strips and how to get help Ubering people to treatment and stuff like that. And so, um, yeah, you know, we do a lot of good stuff. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, what I have been given, I just want people to have the, that same, those same resources. And so that's why we started Set Free Indeed. Um, we've been in this now, you know, many, many years, 20 something. And uh, we're just grateful that we get to wake up and push hope every day. And so, yeah, um, you know, we, you know, the, the, the name of the treatment center was called Free Indeed. And uh, we sold it in 2010. It's still in operation now. We also have started over 28 set free indeed programs throughout the country. The biggest one is in Wasilla, Alaska. They started off just doing Friday nights. Now they have inpatient, outpatient, sober living, and the whole continuum with a $5 million budget um, uh, a year. And somebody asked me, ooh, y'all, y'all, y'all franchise them? So y'all must be living that life. We did not, we gave everything away free. And that's why I believe that, you know, so many good things come back to us because we plant so many seeds. Because at the end of the day, I know how it is to feel like you're you're worthless and you're, you're in hell and you'll never get out of that black hole. And so every day that I get to wake up and push hope um, is a good day. Thank you. Um, your, your work at Set Free, it really is so powerful. We have one more comment from Dr. Zalewski also thanking you. They said, first, thank you so much. Your story is so inspiring and hearing it from you is incredibly powerful, which I agree with that as well. So uh, while we're waiting for a few more questions to come in, uh, we have one question wondering, um, how would you recommend getting started with faith-based help and, and, and what resources would you suggest for someone looking to, to share that? I guess faith-based help, meaning if you're looking for a faith-based approach to treatment or your wellness or, so, and I can answer that both ways. So again, you know, like anything else, you know, and I'm gonna be honest, I, I think that, you know, faith-based organizations, we've been the worst. 
when it comes to helping people with addiction and mental health, because I can't tell you how many times that I've heard people say, you know, they're, they're crazy. You know, that's just a spirit of witchcraft or that's the devil. I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you going to tell the same person who has a diagnosis of, of cancer? Are you going to tell the same person who have a diagnosis of high blood pressure or diabetes? That's a spirit and that's the devil. But, you know, when someone has a, a experience of having a mental health or a brain disease or brain pain, that's what you're going to tell them. Are you kidding me? So we have been the worst. And so that's why a lot of stuff that we have, you know, we have toolkits that we give to churches on how to address uh, trauma, how to address suicide prevention, how to address mental health and substance abuse to hopefully to help them to know that, look, the two can become one. You know, like I always say, you can have a script in the scripture. I do it every day. I take my meds, you know, I have my meditation and my scripture or w workout, whatever it is, whatever works for you, you know, whatever your faith is, then do that. Uh, if you are a faith-based organization, and you want to, you know, get help to take this information back to your community. Because look, faith-based organizations, a lot of times we're that first line of defense because people will go to that faith-based, you know, that community and say, look, I need help. So we need to make sure that, you know, we, uh, we, we, we're connecting faith-based organizations to resources because we all need each other. You know, I'm like Mr. Rogers, who are the people in your neighborhood? You know, faith without works is dead. So we need to work together. So find out what organizations that are doing inpatient, outpatient, detox, you know, whatever, you know, who takes insurance, who take Medicaid, find out. So when somebody comes to you and say they need help or they love one need help, you, it's, I call it the power to refer, find out who those professionals are and, you know, and work with them. And so, you know, I, so I hope I answered that question, you know, so from a perspective of, you know, trying to get help, if you are looking for, or a place that, you know, maybe has a faith-based component to it, you know, just, you know, Google, you know, what's in your area, you know, look for those good words, make sure that they're licensed. Yeah, you know, I know a lot of time we talk about, you know, discipleship, that's good. I don't need no discipleship, I need a doctor. That'll preach right there. What, you know, and, and, and you know, so it's those kind of things. See if those folks are credentialed. Yes, they probably have a heart to serve. They have a heart to help. And that's what's so cool about the faith-based community. But baby, what you don't know, you don't know. And I know a lot of people who went to seminary school. That's what they call it. I call it cemetery school. But, um, and they don't teach about mental health or addiction or about crisis or about, you know, uh, suicide, you know, prevention. Because, you know, that's the sad part. We know the history of that. For the most time part, if, you know, back in the day, if you died by suicide, you didn't get buried in the, you know, regular cemetery or this, all this other stuff. So, you know, having these conversations and these webinars are helpful. And that's why we take this information and we go back and we push it out in our homes and communities. And again, that's how we reduce stigma and that's how we make a difference. Thank you for that advice. We have a question from Dr. Dr. Zalewski. Um, is the medical director for the Rural Behavioral Health Institute, and they do mental health screenings uh, and follow-up care in middle and high schools in Montana. They have a call with the White House next Tuesday discussing a program with President Biden's health policy advisors. And the question is, as someone who has worked with the White House, do you have any advice for me? It is my first time talking with the White House. Well, first of all, yeah, you, and yeah, I do. You know, um, again, like I said, what we thought me going to the State of the Union address was just gonna be, you know, I guess me going to the State of the Union address. I had no idea that I'd be, you know, sitting with Mrs. Bush on the front row. I had no idea I would, the president would talk about us, you know, talk about me in his State of the Union address. I'm sitting there just like everybody else, like what is really going on? For real, for real. And Todd, you do not make a fool of yourself and fall out, you know? That's the first thing. Uh, stay present, you know, just go ready. Um, a lot of times when you're in spaces like that, you know, you only have, if they say an hour, then you need to do it in 45 minutes, for real. I mean, it just happens so fast, but, you know, be your authentic self. Um, speak the truth in love. I think that, you know, we live in a time where we want to, you know, um, I'm not going to say that, but anyway, speak the truth in love, you know, um, go ready and, you uh, just be your authentic self, you know, go ready. I can't say that enough, you know, uh, have your ducks in a row. Uh, it's just another person talking to another person. Um, the follow-up is going to be the thing that needs to happen the most because look, I ain't going nowhere for no photo op. I've been there, done that. I've been in meetings where, you know, this is, and I'm not saying this meeting is, but I've been in places where, you know, well, we're just gonna meet, so we wanna check a box. 
Let them know you ain't come to check a box, baby. You came to make the world better in Montana and, you know, the rest of the world. So just be your authentic self. You know, um, again, that time goes by really fast. Make sure you have your points and whatever you want to hit. Make sure you got them ready. You know, I mean, go locked and, you know, locked and ready to share. And I think that you're going to do well. Look, you know, you're representing a whole lot of great people in the state of Montana. I don't know much about Montana just by what I know about Yellowstone. And uh, one day I do plan to go one day, but um, yeah, just go representing the people that you serve and taking their stories and sharing their stories and you're gonna do just fine. And call me if you need me. I can still give you some pointers on the side because we're being recorded, so I can't say too much. Thanks, Tonja. And I can share your information. Um, it sounds like Dr. Zalewski has 30 minutes to present. So your be ready advice will be uh, very important. Um, we have one more question um, asking, can a parent call 988 if they are worried about their child? Oh, heck yeah. I mean, for sure, for sure. That's why that's another thing why it's such a good resource. I call it a call for help and connections to hope. A call for help and connections to hope. Because yeah, you know, we see all the time. I mean, we look at the news right now and we see that, you know, there are signs and symptoms that we see in our kids, our loved ones. And as a family, you know, I know how it is to feel like I don't have no resources, I don't have no hope. And I've been on the other phone when I'm talking to a parent or I'm talking to a loved one and I'm saying, baby, you know, I'm sorry, but the only, the only thing you could do is call 911. And the parent go, is there something else? Because I don't want to do that, you know, because of the trauma. And so, yeah, you, you, you can do that. You can tell them that what, you know, why you're concerned and they'll ask you a series of questions and connect you to those resources. But absolutely, because we hear so much in the news lately, you know, well, I, I knew something was not right or I knew something was off or they change or stuff like that. So being able to call that number and look, you know, hopefully that's why I said that's another thing. It's going to be different from state to state. And so that's why we have to hold our individual states accountable because what that crisis continuum is going to look like. So in Montana, y'all might have a crisis team in one area and then one area you don't. You know, it should be just like everywhere else in nine, when, when there's a 9-11 call, 911. I don't care where you are. You know, someone should be coming to you in a matter of minutes. And so because every minute count, every second count as you guys know. So absolutely, if you have a, if a loved one or a child who's struggling, you know, and you're not sure what to do, make the call for mental challenges, emotional, and also behavioral health addiction. See, that's a game changer because so many people are going through stuff now and they don't know who to call. So like I said, a call, a call for help and connections to hope. Thanks, Tanja. And we have a comment from Laura. If you're in Utah, Safe UT is also a great resource uh, for parents. And then one more question, um, Tanja, thanks for being a pioneer in making whole person care a reality. How do you envision churches and the faith communities being a part of a local crisis continuum? And that's from Charlie Curie. Hey! Okay, did I just act like I just heard from my uncle. I am sorry. Was that that was kind of that was kind of scary right there. Hey, I think I'm talking to the right Charles Charles Curry. So let me just tell you about that gentleman. The stuff that they did back in the day through ATR was also a game changer for our community. I thought I'd never see something like in my life where you know you had uh, a treatment facility and then you had a faith you know community coming together. I'm talking about the two should become one. That happened on his watch. And the beautiful thing about that was, is that um, faith-based organizations now had a voice. Back in the day, if you said you were a faith-based organization, you wouldn't get nothing. You know, I mean, there were grants out there and that's what, you know, President Bush and, 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 and Mr. Curry and Jim were so, you know, passionate about. It's like, no, we know faith-based organizations have good outcomes. You know, if they don't want to do treatment, what if they have, they have housing? If they don't want to do treatment, what about if they have transportation? If they don't, you know, want to do treatment, what if they have childcare? Because most churches do. Well, how about could we connect with them? When a mom come in who needs help, but she needs a place to for her kid to be, then how about we give a voucher, you know, to that, you know, to that church? If they do stuff according to look, because everything we're all accountable. I don't care who you are, you know, it's called accountability. And so 
if, you know, if, if you qualify, then, you know, you would, you know, receive funding for that. So I think that even now, this is still a great opportunity for faith-based organizations. I'll go back to what I said earlier, but the power to refer, find out who are the people in your neighborhood, you know, and, you know, churches, and that's another thing. We're one of the most un unutilized buildings in our communities. I don't know about you, but if you ride around during the week and you see churches on Sunday, they full, but on Monday and Friday, where y'all at? You know, well, how about opening it up for people to have meetings? What about opening it up for, you know, someone to have a healing circle, you know, where anybody can come all faith? Because at the end of the day, it's all about all of us. And so that program was a game changer. And I still see a whole lot of good because of that in 2003, 2004. But even today, I, I think that there's a place for all of us once we know our places and our spaces and realize we are in this together. And if you want, if, if we say we're part of a faith community, it talks about, you know, us working together. You know, we'll work us together with the creator. We'll work us together. And so there's a space and a place for all of us to work together, faith-based, non-faith. And look, you know, we're not talking about prophetizing and nobody got time for that. I'm talking about, you know, offering people hope, help and healing and meeting them where they are. And so as a, you know, the, the faith community, we have a great opportunity to do that. But we have to make sure that we're connected with the right resources in the community and to realize we're not in competition with each other. We all need each other. Thanks, Tonja. That's great. And then Daryl has his hand raised. So I'm going to unmute Daryl to ask a, a verbal question. Daryl. I do want to say while Daryl is chiming in is that, you know, we have some resources. We did a toolkit um, for faith communities on how to uh, address trauma, uh, how to uh, address um, uh, drug overdose, fentanyl awareness and things like that. And also if churches were interested or, you know, mosque, whatever, whatever your faith community look like, you know, you take, you know, the evidence based practices and the things that we've come up with and just make it your own. And again, it's not about what faith you are. It could be no faith. Long as it's something, a toolkit that can help you help your community, then you know we would be honored to push that information out. Thank you. And Daryl, I think you're, you're unmuted now, so go for it. Tanja, um, I am just so moved to have listened to you. My colleague, Rachel, <laughs> I'll also mute my iPhone. My colleague, Rachel, uh, was uh, kind enough to unmute me. I work with her on the Grand Challenge campaign uh, that we're doing to stop stigma together. And I was so struck by your reference to the country club and the trauma and mental health struggles reside there just like everywhere where else. Uh, I don't belong to a country club, but I'm privileged to have been uh, a psychiatrist, medical school dean, uh, brain researcher, uh, and to head the association for all the medical schools and teaching hospitals in the country. Um, and I'm saddened by how often stigma resides in our physicians our nurses, uh, uh, both regarding their own trauma, their own mental health struggles, uh, but even the patients who come to them. And today, what would your message be to those people who are in healthcare uh, and encounter uh, a patient um, who maybe below the surface has, has gone through horrendous experiences in their life and may be depressed, may be suicidal, may have panic attacks, certainly has PTSD. Well, what would you say to my community? You know, I would say to your community that, you know, first of all, you know, thank you for the work that you do. You know, we know that healthcare, you know, professionals like yourself and others, you guys are amazing. You don't get told that enough until people need you. That's very unfortunate, but that's just how it is. But you guys do amazing work and you are lifesavers. You are also peacemakers. Realize you're peacemakers. See yourself as being a peacemaker. Um, it's just like when we look at, 
uh, EMS or first responders or law enforcement or the military. And I'm also a military vet, nine years military police. And, you know, um, see yourself as a peacemaker, just like they are, because what you guys do, you help us make peace with ourselves. And at the end of the day, that's where real peace starts. You know, we can talk about world peace and that's great, but the peace has to start here. And you guys are able to help, you know, people do that. And if, you know, you, we ha it has to be a whole continuum. We have to make mental health and physical health integrated more. Uh, you know, I know when we go to the doctors and we know you guys are busy, but you know, it's almost like a check box. You know, do you have a mental health diagnosis? Yes, have depression, anxiety. Uh, have you been in, you know, have you ever been in recovery? Yes. And that's basically it, you know? And so we have to do a better job of integrating that more. We have to do a better job in knowing, you know, again, to refer people, you know, it's okay. You know, you should have a, psych a psychiatrist that you're dealing with or, or, or LCSWs or LPC. If you don't have that in your private practice, know where they are. And look, you know, last week, um, we had this thing called Hope to Heal. And it's talked about when the healers are hurting. Uh, I mean, you guys do amazing work and you see, you know, death and destruction and you have to, you know, give people bad news every day. You know, you work these hours, you know, that insurance companies, you know, almost make it mandatory you do. That's a story for another day. But how do you take care of your mental health? And so we wanted to honor just those who are on the frontline workers, particularly who help people with, you know, LC LPCs, LCSWs. We had psychiatrists there, doctors there you know, to talk about stigma and then to push hope to, you know, you guys. So I, I would say, you know, you know, have more conversations like this just among yourselves and know that, you know, all this newness that are, that's happening with peer support specialists and having all these other folks at the table, you know, and let people get involved in their own treatment, you know, and just not say, hey, you're going to take this, 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 and this, and don't ask me no questions. You know, I mean, explain to them, um, you know, make them feel like they are part of their treatment team. Because at the end of the day, you know, even on my worst day, I'm the best, you know, I, I, I'm the, you know, the best authority on myself most of the time, you know, but, you know, if I'm not, get me to those days. So the fact that you're on this conversation, the fact that, you know, this is something you're passionate about, you can be the storyteller. You can be the one that goes spread a message of hope among your peers like you're already doing. But I think having more conversations you know, and doing more integrated care and not just treating from the neck down, but realizing, you know, it starts here to here. It's going to be, again, a game changer for all of us and how we do treatment. Thank you for that answer. And thank you for that question too, Dr. Kirch. So we are just about at time. Um, and I, I'm going to read one more comment of thanks, which I think echoes a lot of what has been said. So uh, Laura said, amen to everything you said. I love how you see that how you feel about you is the most important part of resilience. You are fun and I hope to work with you in the future. So Tanja, thank you again. And thank you to all of our participants and your wonderful, thoughtful questions. And this will be uh, re recorded and, and sent out. So um, thank you all. Yeah, thank you. And like I said, you know, it's addiction and mental health does not discriminate from the curbside to the country club. And that's why we have to make sure the message gets to everybody that there's hope, help and healing and you are not the only one. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you.